This is a lecture from Open Tuition. To benefit from the lecture, you should download the free lecture notes from OpenTuition.com. As you can see by now, there's a lot to absorb with financial instruments. Impairment is next. As my old mum used to say, what goes up must go down. Unfortunately, sometimes financial assets need to be written down because the person to whom you've lent the money or your customer is simply not going to pay. If I was explaining this to someone on a bus and they said, what's this about? It's simply about bad debts. Now, I want to take you around various bits of the note. And the first thing I want to do is to sort out some jargon so we're very careful. So if you look right at the end of the note on impairment, right at the end of the note on impairment, you'll see a word there about an allowance account. When I was brought up a long time ago as an accountant, I'm sure we used to say provision for bad debts. You might even use that word now at work. Please don't use it in the exam. So provisions or provision accounting is reserved for liabilities. So we don't say provision, we say allowance. So write the way through the notes and the exam, please. You call these things allowance for bad debts or strictly, of course, allowance for impairment. Otherwise, you can get into a very, very dreadful pickle. The thrust of what's on this um, bit of note here and these bits of rules is that when you look in the soft P, I'm just making up some numbers for a moment. When you have your financial assets, which will tend to be loan assets, the loan assets may well be, may well have a carrying amount using amortized cost of 100, but the business will sometimes reduce that value because they consider that some of the debt is not recoverable and they do so in a separate account. So the allowance for impairment account, I'm going to make up the number, which is five. So the figure that will appear in the soft P will be 95. Those of you that think of the old T accounts or ledger accounts, there'll be a debit balance for the carrying amount of the loan asset and a credit balance for the allowance for impairment. And the two are offset effectively again when we're preparing again the um, financial statements. But if you think about a trial balance, there'll be a debit balance and a credit balance. Now, I just need to talk a little bit about the politics of this because it may be that when you first learned bookkeeping, you were taught to make allowances for doubtful debts. And that was certainly the position in international UK accounts, uh, international standards accounting until about 2000. And then because a number of companies were making allowances that were subjective, and used it to profit plan. Very strangely, the IESB said, well, we don't think you should make this allowance unless you're absolutely sure that your customer is now insolvent. Now that happened for a period of years. And unfortunately, it may be one of the things that contributed to a debt crisis in the US somewhere in the 2000s because no one really realised that they'd got so much bad debt on their books until it was too late. So some would say we have returned to the days of prudence in the way that we account for these bad debts now. So there's a little bit of prudence coming back. In the framework, we said that prudence is not really a fundamental characteristic, um, part of a characteristic. It's more about neutrality but it still exists.
When we look at the impairment rules, there are impairment rules, the messy ones, are to do with loan assets. So just in the margin here, I'm just writing loan assets. The rules are very messy. But because financial assets do not actually just loan assets, they might be regular things like receivables. So if Mr. Bun sells some potatoes to Madame Dupont, he doesn't really want to go through all this model here. So in practice, they use a simplified version for receivables. So the rules here are for regular loan assets, but there are simplified rules further down which deal with receivables. And we'll pick those up when we get further down in the note. So if the question says receivables, you don't have to worry about this sophisticated looking model. When you look at the model, one thing I want you to appreciate is that, in theory, wicked directors could literally make the numbers up as they go along. And that's the problem with allow permitting these allowances. You do get subjectivity, but maybe you don't get a debt crisis. So imagine you're lending a load of money to another company. The model talks about three stages. But for practical purposes, there's not really much difference between the three stages. At stage one, effectively, stage one is when you initially recognize the loan asset. At that stage, you might consider it appropriate to recognize a small allowance. That allowance is said to be the present value of expected credit losses in the next 12 months. Now we'll talk about what that means in a minute, but all I want you to appreciate is that at that stage, there's a little bit of an allowance that might be made. That means if you like the old ledger accounts, there'll be a debit balance on the loan asset and a credit balance on the allowance. Stage two is when things are looking bad. And this is where there's a little piece of practical advice here. If it looks like the quality of the person that you've lent to is deteriorating, in that case, you then need to recognize a much bigger allowance. And that much bigger allowance, again, you can see here, is said to be the lifetime expected credit losses. Again, you might be saying, well, where will I find these numbers? In an exam, you'll just be told them. At that stage, well, the, the practical advice that they do give is where that there are 30 days of arrears in terms of the money that should be coming in. So if you've noticed that you've got 30 days arrears, so the person to whom you've lent the money has not repaid an interest amount or something within 30 days of when they should. That's potentially when you move to stage two. Again, those of you look like the old T accounts. First of all, at stage one, you had a, a, a loan asset and an allowance. Now at stage two, you've got a loan asset and a bigger allowance. Stage three is when it all goes absolutely topsy, where there is objective evidence of impairment. So this is much more at the stage when the customer is insolvent. Well, the, the key thing I think to appreciate is that in terms of the size of the allowance, it doesn't make any difference because it's still the lifetime losses that you expect. I think what would happen though, is that instead of having two ledger accounts, you would now just have one. There's no point in keeping the allowance account anymore. So they'll net, they will net the allowance and the loan asset accounts off. So you just end up with one account 
in the in the um in the ledgers of the business but the thing to appreciate is that when you initially recognize you don't have to worry about what the lifetime losses might be you just look at what those losses are and what the chances of them actually occurring in the next 12 months if things go bad the size of the allowance gets bigger and the thing above all to appreciate is that this is absolutely wildly subjective they call this again an expected credit loss model which is a very posh way of saying if you expect to make a loss you accrue for it now even though that loss hasn't yet occurred so they're the bits that we really need to learn the bits that I've just highlighted in yellow we have if I just come a little bit further on in the note we have got an example it's quite long so you might find it easier to pause the tape read the paragraphs of the first part of the illustration and then resume it stage one then is when you initially recognize the financial asset and the related allowance account as it says here you have to assess 12 month credit losses in practice what they will do they'll have to discount it as well but for the moment don't worry about the discounting um if they think that lifetime losses are 200,000 and they think that the chance of default in the next 12 months is 2% they would therefore set up an allowance account of 4,000 so for the moment I know it refers to unwinding the discount but just keep it to the basic as always keep it simple so initially you've got an allowance in the books of 4,000 they're expecting lifetime losses of 200 but the chance of things going wrong this year is just two percent when you get to stage two when you get to stage two that's when you start to think about lifetime losses being accrued in full so initially they thought the allowance was four they would now want to have an allowance of 200 there'd be a huge charge in the profit and loss what's 200 minus 4 200 minus 4 is 196 some of that relates to the unwinding of the discount again I wouldn't really get too worried about that but the message is isn't it that a very small allowance becomes a big one if the customer becomes a big problem finally at stage three well all that's going to happen is that as it says here when you're at stage three you're still going to be looking at the same lifetime losses when they talk about the rate of interest on the net value of the debt investment again don't get terribly worried about that the reason it's on the net value is that they will have netted off the two ledger accounts so at that stage there'll no longer be a debit balance and a credit balance they'll net the two off a bit like you you, you used to do when you did your first accounting exam and learned about bad debt accounting so once again trying to explain that to an ordinary person on a bus prudence is back we always make a small allowance at the start which will get much bigger of course if the customer gets 30 days or more in arrears final point on impairment is that if you've got something like regular receivables you can't possibly have that because by the time you've paid your accountant to explain that it's probably more than the value of the receivables in terms of the fees so in almost all cases if you have receivables on the assumption they don't have a significant financing component so on the assumption it's not like 
five years interest-free credit, you will simply base the allowance on lifetime losses right from the start. You might say, well, if you don't expect the customer to pay right at the start, why sell them? Well, that's not financial reporting, is it? We're not bothered about the motivation of the business. We're just bothered about the double entry. So there is a little chat about impairment.